It's the Final Word Cricket Podcast, Season 16, Episode 5. It's very late at night for me here in London. It's very early in the morning for Jeff in Melbourne. We've both had busy weekends. We're recording on a Monday, which is quite unusual for our weekly show, but we have a busy week ahead. We have plenty to talk about, as is always the case, when uh, there's been a lot going on around the cricketing world, both in England, in Australia, in India. It's the release of the Wisdom Cricketers' Almanac, which we'll come to in a moment as well. But I thought I would start, Jeff, by asking you about your weekend because you've been uh, busy uh, visiting Harrow, a place we went to together about 18 months ago, uh, and Mm. you've had another special time out there. G'day. Hello. Yeah, um, it was almost a year and a half, I suppose, that we were out there after the T20 World Cup. We went by the museum in Harrow that commemorates the 1868 Aboriginal team that Travelled to England, um, you know, the, the the first sporting team to leave Australian shores long before the idea of the a country being called Australia had even been come up with. So you'll you'll remember it. You'll remember um, interviewing Josie Sankster down there. Mm. So she'd been in touch since about um, the, the busy events program that they have down there. They they had a, a, a big match that they played in March and. And then this weekend they had uh, the start of a new thing, which is they're, they're hoping to continue into the years ahead, which was a, a veterans game for in, an Indigenous New South Wales veterans team and, and a, in, an Indigenous Victorian veterans team. So over 50s um, getting down to play a couple of games. They played a 40-over game on the Saturday and a 20-over game when everyone was a bit sore and more feeling sorry for themselves on the Sunday. <laughs> um, but, I mean... It, just, just a remarkable experience. Like it was, it was a pleasure to be there. You know, Harrow's way off in in Western Victoria. You're getting pretty close to the South Australian border by that point. So, it's a long trek down from Melbourne, um, and it and it's beautiful country down there. It's it's sort of low, gentle hills and um, lots of dramatic stands of gum trees and um, creeks and, and rivers roll, rolling through them. Harrow's on the creek down there, um, and the the cricket ground there, so that's where Unaram and um, who's more broadly known as Johnny Muller, who was the great standout player on that eighteen sixty eight team, he grew up down that way, um, and he ended up playing for Harrow later in his life um, in, in the years that he was allowed to before the Harrow team got kicked out of the local um, competition for various <laughs> reasons, mostly because they won too much with his help. Um, so the the oval in in the town is named the Johnny Muller Oval. Um, he's he's buried up at the Harrow Cemetery, and, and that's why the museum ended up being started there. Um, and so th- there was that was the, the reason behind using that place, using that oval to have those teams come down and, and play those games and feel some closer connection to to the start of this story of Aboriginal cricket um, all those years ago. Yeah, right. I, I like the fact that. The veterans are getting a chance to turn out as well. I saw that Australia named their over 50s Ashes squad today. We I touched on this, I think, on story time last week mm. about how veterans cricket's becoming a, a big and bigger and bigger part of the participation story. But um, the fact that the, a bunch of uh, old fellas have decided to turn out uh, across a couple of days, that's pretty cool. Well, I'll tell you what was great about it, particularly. So, um, three members of the the 1988 touring side. So in, in 88, as part of the, the bicentenary celebrations, they had an Aboriginal side that toured England to to, to link back to the 1868 side, so 120 mm-hmm. years later. And then there was the subsequent tour in 2018 that, um, that some of the Australian reps like Ash Gardner and Scott Boland and so on were, were playing in those teams. But the 1988 team was, was much more pulled together. They managed to get some funding out of that bicentennial um, celebrations hot and get a team over there. So um, three of the the players from that side were were there in the Victorian team, which was you know was was great to um, to see them there. And um, Uncle Les Knox, who's uh, an, an elder from New South Wales, who's been one of the biggest drivers of Aboriginal cricket. He played grade cricket in in Sydney sort of during the what, 60s, 70s, um, and was annoyed that there were so few Aboriginal players and he would get asked why there, why there were so few and so he made it his business to, to try to change that. He, he ran youth coaching camps for years, decades really. He's, um, uh, he's just pushed and pushed to, to try to, to change that story and so you know he's, and, and he's had health problems in the last couple of decades as well but he's still kicking 
Um, so he was there. He'd made made a 16-hour drive to get down there to Harrow. Um, they had a, a big event on the Saturday night in, in the Harrow pub, which which has a big hall above the pub. And so, uh, you know, Jason Gillespie and Scott Boland had sent through video messages for everybody, Ian Chappell as well. Um, they had a, a, a quiz about the 1868 team, um, had some... Had a musical performance from Matt Scullion, who's written a song about the 1868 tour. So it was just this this real celebration, and 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 then after the games, you know, to hear those guys speaking um, about what it meant to them. So Matt Lewis, the captain of the New South Wales team, and Rob Hyatt is the captain of the Victorian team, and to hear them speaking about particularly about how life expectancy for Aboriginal men is so much lower than for any non-Aboriginal population groups in Australia, and and to basically be looking around at their teammates and saying, well, we're, we're in the group that's not expected to be around much longer and, and we want to change that story and we want to, we want to put the story out to, to our comrades to say, well, you know, let's stay active and keep healthy and keep being involved with the game that we love and, and the, the mental health benefits of that of being in a group of guys who, who have the same or have similar life experiences um, and, and who can can give each other that extra charge of being together on the field and the, like the camaraderie was remarkable between both of the teams um both the umpires who came down got well involved with it as well they were they were so happy and friendly to, um you know happy to be out there both the teams were ribbing each other and um in on each other's jokes you know there was no competitive tension there was a good quality a good standard of cricket played but um, but it was I've, I've never seen two teams who were both so firmly pulling in the same direction. What a great experience. I mean, hopefully you're in a position to sort of tell that story with some of the participants in greater depth at some stage for the podcast because that sounds like a you know the sort of thing that, well, I mean, clearly when we went there 18 months ago, we were both affected by how just how magnificent that museum is and mm. and how um, how dedicated JC is to the upkeep of it, but. This, these wider activities and Harrow becoming such a centre of uh, a centre of oh, is cricket tourism the right word? But, but people go there; it's a destination, mm. right? When you come to Australia now to um, go on a cricket trip, you, it's likely you'll be invited to go to Harrow, and that wouldn't have been possible until yeah. I guess ten or fifteen years ago. So it's a, yeah, a special a special spot in the uh, in the history of the Australian game, and um, yeah, I'm glad you've uh, had the chance to sample it in this way over the last couple of days. I'd love there to be more of it too. I mean, a lot of people who travel from Melbourne to Adelaide for the Adelaide Test, that sort of thing. Um, it's it's simple enough to stop in on the way. Mm. Um, you know, Josie's very quick to point out that it's not just her making this happen. There's a whole committee of, of locals in Harrow who volunteer their time. I mean, the whole place is is run on the smell of an oily rag, and it was remarkable to meet those people who you know some of them have been on the committee for twenty years, um, volunteering to to keep the place running. Um, it's, you know, to, uh, chatting to, to locals who are so invested in this and, you know, I don't want to paint too rosy a picture of it and, and you don't want to fall into stereotypes either, but it, it's a fact that you know, most rural areas in Australia voted heavily against the, the referendum for Indigenous recognition, for instance, and that's no different out that way. But at the same time, uh, I'm meeting people who are who are white farmers, who some of whom have, have been on the land for generations, who, who are deeply respectful of the, the stories of Indigenous people from that area and who want to know more about it and who want to be involved with that and to, and to help tell that story. So, you know, it was quite a remarkable experience, quite a remarkable town, um, all, all centred around the, the Hermitage Hotel out there, which, which Suzanne runs, you know, and, and it was a remarkable group of people running that place as well. I, I just feel, you know, I'm, I was quite overwhelmed coming back at, at, at what a... What a, what a, what an emotional and sort of encouraging and and wholesome feeling weekend it was, and and mm. pretty funny as well. I mean, the, you know, some of the the stuff going back and forth on the field, both teams getting into the umpires at different times, um, who who were who were rolling with it, and you would have enjoyed the looseness. I think, like I I rocked up. I knew I was I was hosting the thing on the Saturday, but I rocked up on the Friday, um, and it ended up you know helping put out all the fences and put up the marquees and so on. The Saturday I showed up, they were about to go on the field and there was nobody at the scoreboard. I was like, do you, do you need a scorer? And they're like, oh, yeah, that'd be handy. So I ended up scoring 80 <laughs> overs on the, on, on the Saturday Oh, that's great. Which I wasn't anticipating. And then you'll enjoy this. I haven't told you this yet. Um, Sunday, a couple of the big 
you guys had to go home on the Sunday morning and there was a, a hamstring had gone as well. So they were like, oh, we're short a player. <laughs> Do you want to suit up? And I was like, oh, oh this is an over 50s Indigenous team. I am neither of those things. And they're like, yep, well, we've got, <laughs> we don't have enough. So you better get the kit on. So I had to play um, on the on the Sunday afternoon, which was you know I didn't disgrace myself. Got an over in and, and made a few um, batting right down there at, at the end of the innings. Um, so you know, and that was a real privilege as well to be to be on the field with those guys. Um, you know, with with Laurie Marks and, and Greg James and Bert from the the eighty eight tour, um, and you know, and and, and some of the, the the leaders who've come along since then. Um, yeah, something I'll never forget. In its own way, you've represented your state, and you didn't yeah. let the big V down. Very nice. <laughs> I had my own officially a Victorian state represented. <laughs> It'll do. It'll do. My, my voice is a bit sketchy um, tonight because, uh, well, the game I was doing over the weekend, which, um, and we'll talk a lot about the county championship in the middle segment, um, but it got very exciting, kind of out of nowhere. Um, mm. I'll go into more depth about the game itself in the county wrap too, but. The short version is this. They're about to shake hands at five o'clock, as you do when a game's uh, moving towards a draw. Then Somerset lost three wickets in sort of five minutes, and suddenly Surrey are like, hang on a minute. We've got 20 overs left and 209 runs to chase. We're going to have a mm. pop at this. They lost one to a rain delay that came from nowhere, but basically they had 19 overs to mow down 209. And for the first 10 or so overs of that, they were up with the run rate, and they were zero down with Jamie Smith and Dan Lawrence pongoing them everywhere. So um, being on commentary for that necessitated going a, a sniff the harder than I was expecting mm -hmm. today. So I'm, I'm a little bit knackered, um, <laughs> but it, it, it was all worthwhile. I really enjoyed it. I'm, I'm actually downstairs back in my living room for those watching on YouTube. Right. I haven't recorded a, a podcast down here for, for, for quite a long time with obviously um, everyone else well and truly asleep by the time I've hit record on this upstairs. And um, there were some other um, fun bits today. Uh, the first bit is back on the Surrey game. Uh, mm. Norcross was with me and and delivered one of the funniest bits of commentary that I've ever heard. It was over three different segments, but um, I'm just going to drop in uh, this one here, which is Daniel um, giving you uh, his impression of the way that David Bumble Lloyd commentates when the game is going <laughs> slowly. So that listicle uh, bit that Daniel was doing there, he rolled it out two more times before the stint was over. So thank you to Hypercourse right. for clipping it up. It's great to have a record of it. And, and Bumble approved. He, he wrote back to my message saying that he, um, he, was, uh, he thinks Dan got it absolutely spot on. So well played on that front. It's not even the most important sporting moment of my day, though. I've got to say, I woke up this morning, and I'm not going to go on about this too much, but I woke up to find out that Jason Dunn still has been um, uh, elevated to legend status in the Australian Football Hall of Fame. Like that is my childhood hero. I tell you what, the 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 role model that he was, and I, I raise it only as a, him as a sportsman. Um, the selfless way that he played mm -hmm. footy, um, the dignified way that he always conducted himself on the field, uh, the charitable way that he always recognised teammates, never celebrated his own personal milestones, but always wanted to celebrate those of others. Um, he was the the mm -hmm. perfect childhood role model, and you could tell when you were playing junior footy. Um, who else was a Hawthorne supporter? The way you could tell was that when you'd see them kick a goal, they just um, they'd also just wipe their hands and walk back to full forward after acknowledging the person that kicked it to them. No celebrations, no carry on. You know, aha, mm -hmm. that's a Hawthorne supporter. They're also trying to um, live up to the Jason Dunstall, um, the Jason Dunstall behaviour, if you like, the standard that he set. And um, I have a wonderful memory at the 2011 uh, AFL Hall of Fame do, or Australian Football Hall of Fame do, I should say, which mm -hmm. is run by the AFL up at Parliament House in Canberra. Uh, a mate of mine who was working for Sky News and still is, Kieran Gilbert, was sat next to Jason Dunstall and he told Jason about me and my love of the man and he switched sheets for about 90 minutes and I told him that, you know, you are my childhood hero and he like and he kind of clicked. He's like, oh, you're one of those. This must happen a bit for him, right? Right, yeah. Uh, being the, the, the fabulous footballer that he was, the, the greatest of his generation. And he kind of worked out, oh, you're one of those people, are you? I'm going right. to be the best human being I can be. You know, you know they, they, they say don't meet your heroes. It was the complete right. opposite with Jason Dunstall. Totally indulged it, told every story, was t very generous and charitable and, and, right. and all the rest of it. And, um, you know, that, that's, the, that's the standard, I think, for people who have achieved a lot in sport, that when they meet people who, who they've had an influence on, that they feel like they can give some back the other way as adults. And that was a, a lovely thing. And 
yeah, it's uh, I, I've 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 watched a lot of highlights of Jason Dunstall today. I've, uh, I've uh, not not <laughs> the sure Dean Jones have. testimonial game where he made a half century when opening the batting for uh, for Dino's team. Not that exactly, but uh, other stuff and um and and his press conference and and so on. So I just wanted to note that on the way through. We've talked a lot about Dermot Burton on the pod at different times, and I got a message from Barat about Dermot Burton last week. He was watching Dermy's highlights. Well, you know, Dermy, big part of my childhood, but an even bigger part. Um, was, was Jason. So um, that, that, was a, that was a pretty cool thing. Speaking of Brat, last thing I'll say by way of introduction today, I'm sure in rural Victoria, where you were, you also caught what he was up to with his professional wrestling um, ringside yep. announcer debut um, with uh, Eric Bischoff and, and, um, and, and, uh, and all the rest of the travelling roadshow who were there in Ballarat. So um, Brat star um, rises in all sorts of weird and wonderful ways and the homemade cape i think it is that he was wearing and and so on so if you yeah. haven't caught well, that i saw yet, it uh, i'm I saw sure it rattle up, up close he, he dropped through harrow on the way back on the sunday he, he went back to adelaide <laughs> via harrow so he, he dropped in and caught the end of the game and met some of the people and he was wearing the jacket that isha had made for him um with all of the, the sort of colorful um the streamers all over it so yeah that was quite a sight in the in the harrow pub um chatting to the locals um wearing wearing that full regalia and <laughs> people are taking photos with him and so on it was good fun so good uh jeff um the wisdom cricketers almanac we're doing a a full dedicated interview our annual interview with lawrence mm. booth at um at the uh, lord's library tomorrow i'll catch up with lawrence in our tuxedos which has become something of a final word tradition in the last five sure. years it's always one of our most downloaded episodes of the year and people really enjoy the perspective that he gives as the the wisdom editor so I, I won't go into any of that yet but we probably won't do all of the awards tomorrow with him i might just focus our chat on the editor's notes so but the awards are significant as they always are but with the embargo coming off i thought i'd run through the, the noteworthy ones. so the the five cricketers of the year harry brook which well that was fairly obvious mark wood which i thought was a great selection having never won it before ash gardner um, you referred to ash a moment ago being an indigenous woman earning that recognition primarily for her 12 wickets in the test at Nottingham mm. last year. Usman Khawaja, who um, who I, I suppose it's been a long time coming, given he visited England to play test cricket for the first time 12 years earlier. And Mitchell Stark, who was the, the Compton Miller medalist for Australia and, and picked up the most wickets, even having missed the first test of the series. So um, five very worthy uh, recipients of, of that gong, which, mm. as always, a reminder that needs to be um, it's recognised on what happened in the last England summer, not the whole yeah. year of 2023. But I, I thought that was it, a, a great set of selections. It's interesting that there's there's no domestic representative. You know, you've, often you'll get one one of the five will be for what happened in the county championship over the course of that season because it's not just the international season. But, but I suppose being such a, a hotly contested, intense Ashes series and where, where, you know, all of the cricket oxygen in England that summer was soaked up by that, um, having them come across the two, um, the, the men's and women's series is, is remarkable. And, um, well, I suppose I mean, that Siva Brunt would have, must have won it before, mustn't she? She must have been in the yeah. final before because, you know, she was the other yeah. really dominant player <laughs> with, especially through those 50 over um, games in, in the women's ashes. Yeah, I think Nat Siverbrunt won it uh, after the 2017 World Cup, so in the 2018 edition. And uh, Pat Cummins, I reckon, Jeff won it after the 2019 Ashes in the 2020 edition. And what do you know? Siverbrunt and Cummins are the, uh, have won the leading cricketer in the World Award for the, for the first time, respectively. The first time an Australian man has won it since Michael Clarke in 2012, it would have been for his 2011 year or maybe 2013 mm -hmm. for his 2012. Either way, we're going back a fair while since it's been an Australian man. And, and yeah, Sibber Brunt winning that recognition for the first time. The Wisdom Trophy, which has been reallocated to the test performance of the year. It used to be the, the trophy that was given out for England West Indies test series, but they um, ditched that in favour of the Botham Richards. And with the Wisdom Trophy needing a new home, Lawrence found a place for it here. Um, that went to Travis Head for his 163 in the World Test Championship final last year, which I thought was spot on. Yep. And this is, a, this is a good one too, I reckon. The leading T20 player in the world um, hasn't gone to a man for the first time. Hayley Matthews is the leading T20 player in the world. So that's never mm. had a, a gender specificity, but it's gone to men, I suppose, on the basis that there's been just simply more T20 cricket played for the men. But 
Hayley Matthews, who's been just phenomenal um, as the, the West Indies leader in the last 12 months, um, recognised in the Almanac as the, as the leading player in that format across the world, um, and, um, and fair enough to... Well, I guess also that her streak was so dominant that, you know, it, it, it really doesn't matter how much was played. I don't think you could find anybody who had such a hot streak as the one that she had mm. across that Australian tour and, and some games either side of that. It, it was a, a truly remarkable scoring run to the point where it was more surprising when she didn't make runs than when she did. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Jeff, other news that, that came through today uh, when I was at the Oval, and, and you know, maybe appropriately so that we were at the cricket um, when we found out that Derek Underwood passed away. Um, look, a, a cricketer whose story that we know well, we've told before on our history show, but to recap in short, 86 test matches for England, 297 wickets. Uh, he took 2,465 first-class wickets, which sim- that, that, that simply could never happen again, at an average mm-hmm. of 19. Um, we, we know about his longevity. We know about his relationship with Alan Knott, his wicketkeeper. And look, those images as a young man in 1968 at the Oval, uh, where um, he took four wickets in 27 balls to, to win that test match with six mm-hmm. minutes to spare after the the Oval crowd had mopped up the ground, unexpectedly getting back on. And that, that last wicket with Inverarity, that's an iconic Ashes moment. Um, he, he would have overtaken Fred Truman and he would have taken 300 test wickets if not for the fact that he, uh, well, initially was a World Series cricket player, but also a rebel tourist. So that's something that's that's worth noting on the way through. But, you know, you, you think about where Underwood started his career in black and white television and, and it morphs into a career that's in coloured clothing and, and coloured TV. So much happened between mm. 1968 and, and when he finished up as a professional in 1987 and that wider context as well for those who require it as just how good he was. The ICC yep. retrospectively do their um, rankings, as we know. He was the number one bowler in the world for four years. Between September 1969 and August 1973, he was the top dog uh, for ranking points. So um, an all-timer, um, if not the greatest England spinner of all time, certainly in the top couple, you'd think most judges would have him as number one. Yeah. Deadly Derek with his unusual uh, medium pace approach, the angled sort of way he ran in, but, but the way he, he bowled and it was so effective over such a long stretch of time. Uh, a, a true all-timer, died today at age 78. And how famously dangerous he was, on, especially on damp pitches, those kind of ones that yep. they used to get more often back then, I suppose, where it would misbehave. We spoke to Glenn Turner in our interview with him a few weeks ago about facing Underwood when uh, when England were, were ripping up New Zealand and Turner carried his bat for about 43 and when everybody else was falling apart at the other end. <laughs> so, yeah, he's someone with, with so many stories about him. Um, Jack Clark died during the week as well, yeah. who was the, the board of... Um, Cricket Australia, or I suppose the ACB, as it might have been back when he started getting involved. Um, 2008 to 2011 was when he had the top job. Um, he was 21 years on the, the SACA board, the South Australian Cricket Association board. Came into the job in, in the way that people used to do, you know, being a, a, a first grade cricketer for Glenelg, um, being a solicitor by day and, and sports governance as the occasional thing that you fitted in around the other bits and pieces um, when you were a volunteer at meetings, that sort of thing. Um, significant part to play in cricket Ministry of history in Australia, initiated the Argus Review after the Ashes defeat in 2010-11 um, and the Crawford Review that was the one about governance that sort of um, shook up the way that the CA was structured. Um, so, you know, he, he played a big role over a, a long period of time. Also, the, the early years of the BBL, when they were trying to work out what this BBL would look like, he was in the chair when um, they, they helped arrive at a decision for it not to be a, a right. privately owned tournament and to be effectively a state-owned enterprise. Um, it, these were volatile, tricky times, right? You know, you mentioned the Crawford Review, the move to independent directors, Australia losing an Ashes series at home. I, I, I had a relationship with Jack um, in the time that I was in, in politics, and he was always such a a lovely guy to talk to, a passionate guy. He was sort of would would command the room around a lunch table. He used to love all of that. Mm. Um, and, and also, uh, you consider that he had this ICC responsibility in the post Monkey Gate era, uh, when the IPL was on the way up, and I suppose Australia's um, Australia's strength was on the wane to a point, mm. uh, as India's uh, 
relatively speaking, went up. So these were volatile and tricky times that he oversaw uh, and, yes, passed away during the week at age 70. So um, congratulations to him. Uh, well, congratulations is the wrong term, of course, but an acknowledgement um, of, of the work that he did on behalf of uh, cricket, both in Australia and South Australia, which which was um, widely reported on this time last week. Mm. All right. It's time for us to get into a little bit of... Nerd Pledge. Before we reach the break, Nerd Pledge, that's the game that we play. The cricket quiz game, the history game that we play with people who listen to the show who want to help us fund it. They send in a contribution. It is in an amount, which is also a number that relates to cricket in some way. We have to work out what it is. Satchmo Distel is our Nerd Pledger. He's been on the show before, the Satch. Yep. $7.64 in USD. That means that 764 is the number. It can be interpreted in whatever way Adam likes. But it comes with this clue, which says... In his Chennai Music Club, the bouncers came in pairs. Yes, well, Satchmo has had a bit of a theme to his earlier pledges relating to the West Indies, so I, I was I was able to quickly get to where I needed to be on this one. A fairly obvious reference point, 764. Well, let's go with 7 for 64. Famous figures uh, in a, well, what became a famous Indian, not West Indian, win. Uh, mm. In the seventy four seventy five season, a long trip to the subcontinent for the Windies. They they played five tests in India. They visited a couple of other countries on their on their jaunt as well. Um, and they did enjoy a great record against India before. They'd won all three previous tours, or all three previous series rather, in India without losing a test match in forty eight forty nine fifty eight fifty nine and and sixty six sixty seven. So expectations were kind of set accordingly for Clive Lloyd's team. He was a relatively inexperienced leader at that point, but still it was a, a sense of what would be to come in Bangalore at least, where it's Viv Richards' debut, Gordon Greenwich makes his debut as well, and they win by 267 runs with the skipper Clive Lloyd making 163. Then at Delhi, uh, they win by an innings and 17 mm-hmm. runs, which is Richards' first test 100. He made 192 not out, Viv. And Lance Gibbs, towards the end of his career, um, took one of his last five wicket bags, a, a six for there in a winning effort. But then there's the the India fight back in the series. So they win at Calcutta in the post Christmas test by 85 runs. Andy Roberts takes five for 50 in that, in a loss. More on him later. Um, but Vishwanath made 139 and, and Bishan Beatty bowled out the Windies on the final day. Which brings us to Chennai, the city in question. With this series, you know, very much alive, um, 2-1 scoreline going into the fourth. It was a test played between the 11th and the 15th of January, 1975. India win the toss and bat, and they only make 190. Vishwanath, who, who made 100 in the, in the previous test, made 97 not out of that. And this is where Roberts uh, took our number, 7 for 64. Mm-hmm. Uh, the reference to bounces in pairs, well, this surely goes to his ability to bowl different types of bounces. I mean, we were familiar right. with, with what he did to David Hooks, but also that he had this way of bowling the slower, deceptive bouncer, which would get taken on, and then the quicker, more dangerous one would follow. And this was a, a feature of this innings where he took the seven-wicket bag. It was his first overseas tour for the West Indies. Uh, he took 37 wickets at 19 across the seven test matches they played in, in India and Pakistan. Uh, Wisden Almanac, I went back to the report on this spell. His bumper was his main weapon, although he did not use it to the extent that his methods could have considered intimidatory. So I think what they're trying to say there was he was judicious in the way that he tried mm-hmm. to scare the hell out of the Indian batsman. Um, Roberts himself, he was you, you get a sense of why he was so bloody competitive when you realise that he was the youngest of... 15 children. So I suppose when you're coming at the end of the pecking order, you know how to make it work with not much. I I guess that must be the the, the way it is when you're, when you're coming that late on, when you've got so many people ahead of you, so many mouths to eat. How did you get enough to to eat? Like how did you become tall and strong (laughs) and big? You've got 15 and 14 in front of you at the table. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's certainly strong. I interviewed him a few years ago and he's still um, to this day, the the kind of he's commanding. He's a commanding guy. Uh, really nice piece on Crick Info uh, by Sankaran Krishna um, about um, about following this match as a 15 year old. Um, so uh, Glenn, you know, Glenn, what a uh, Glenn Finkel this is. What a me to um, throw in here as well. Were there anyone in our audience 
had ever heard the story of Andy Roberts not bothering to hide the shiny side from batters because he knew mm. he could turn the ball around in his delivery action. Um, this isn't something that I've heard before, but Glenn swears that he's heard Roberts talk before about like kind of showing the shiny side and then as mm. he loads up, being able to flip the ball in his hand and deceive a batter. So if you've ever heard Andy Roberts tell that story and can verify that for Glenn Finkel, he'll appreciate it. How do you, anyway, how do you, back to the... So I'm, I'm holding an imaginary yeah, know, cricket right. ball at the moment trying to work out how... Cause, so if you rotate it, uh, you know, sort of crossways, then you'll just end up with the same configuration. So then how does he... How does he turn well, it Well, I guess what they're trying to say is that he would have flipped the ball around 180 degrees, right? So he yeah. flicked it in his hands, I'm tipping, is how he did it. Or he had such loose loose hands on the way in that he, could that he was able to try and... throw it within his hand and catch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Time. I'm imagining like a flick from yeah. one from one part of the hand to the other. So um, that's wow. a, just a nice bit of added, added colour, wow. I suppose. Could he, could he tie a cherry stalk into a knot with his tongue? This is a question <laughs> well, that people want to know. Well, We'll try and find out. Back to the test just to round this off. India fought back after being all out 190 um, in their first innings. They dismissed the West Indies for 192. Then they make 256 and the Windies only get 154. So India win by 100 runs to square the series to all. Uh, Prasanna took nine for the match. Mm -hmm. Uh, So there was spin as well as pace, I suppose, in that track. In the decider, the Windies win it though. They win the series 3-2. Um, which is a rarity in Test cricket to yep. go to the final test and it to be um, a, a Desmond, especially given it was a 2 0 down, then 2 all, kind of like 30, mm. well, exactly like 36 37, except that the team that won the, in this case, won the first test, went on to win the fifth as well. Clive Lloyd, after well, his talent at the start of the series, bookended it the with way. 242 not out, and Gibbs um, took a seven for so two greats of West Indies cricket. Job done. Not Andy Roberts' best figures, though. I, I kind of thought, well, oh, seven for 64. No, not that at all. Later in the year, or at the very end of um, 75, I guess it would have been, he took mm. seven for 54 at Perth, um, which was their one win in that series, the Happy Hooker series, but a sign of what would be to come uh, when the Windies stuck it up Australia in Perth and would go on to be such a force thereafter. Um, Roberts would go on to take 202 test wickets at 26 in his brilliant test career, that ran through to 1983. And I'm sure that what Satchmo was directing us to was when it all really started for him at Chennai in 75 when he took his seven for 64. Very good. Thanks, Satch. If you want to send us a nerd pledge, go to patreon.com slash the final word. And that is where you can get involved with all the fun times happening on our chat page and all of the other online community stuff as well. Help us keep making the show. Um, And there'll be plenty more stories and numbers on story time coming up on the weekend let's go to a break it's the final word with jeff lemon and adam collins who is about to head off to serious crickets uh, the place where they're putting the kits together the place where they're selling you all the gear um, and the place where they do a lot of online coaching videos tutorials but you're going to go and get some real-time coaching from hinders yourself are you working mm. on off breaks is that the idea yeah, they've got all the gear and and, and plenty of ideas uh, based on what I've seen on on YouTube. Um, I so the main reason plenty of people yeah, you that could say that about quite that, that we're talking about them at the moment is the is the really outstanding discount you can get through serious cricket. So they're based in Hampshire. I'm getting the um, I'm getting the train from Waterloo down to is it Basingstoke? I think that's how you pronounce it. Sure. I should know really. It's not that's far right. away from where my wife grew up. I know that much. Um, in the morning, uh, and they're going to take me down there and put me in the nets with Hinders, who's their um, club pro who played a little bit for Hampshire back in the day, bowling off spin for them. So I'll soak up everything that's going. Um, I, I'm, I feel like that, you know, I feel like a kid sometimes when it comes to my bowling. I just I just want to learn everything I can about finger spin. So I'll do that with them, and we'll do a collab on YouTube. That'll be fun. That'll come out later in the week. But far more importantly, how's this? Now, if you pop in the offer code we're giving you at the moment, remembering that no one gives offer codes on Cricket Kit the month before the season starts, the recreational season starting in May. This is, this is peak season. This is like giving a discount at a retail store on December the 15th. You wouldn't do it. Wouldn't but do they it. are. Why would but you? They are because they want to work with us. Final word 24 is the code. Final word 24 in the bar at Serious Cricket. Dot co. Dot uk. That's all in the in the show notes. Clearly, just click through from there. You don't need to worry about remembering the URL. Um, but if you if you find something that's already discounted, you get that on top of it. So a lot of times, an offer code won't work on discounted kit. Ours does. The Ooh. DSC Black Cricket Bat. I've used that in the testing with 
yep. serious sport that I did with Wisdom um, a couple of months ago. That's an incredible bit of kit. They've got 15% off that at the moment. So if you pop in the final word, 10% off, uh, it comes to, I'm reliably informed, a 23% discount on a bet that everybody wants. Uh, so, yes, serious cricket. Hit them in the show notes uh, and we'll um, we'll tell you more about them on YouTube and on social media and whatnot during the week. But, yeah, if you're in the UK, take advantage of this. No one else is looking after you with all the kit they've got, the way that serious cricket are at the moment. And that runs all the way through the month of April. Jeff. Very good. Thank you. The... Indian uh, domestic women's multi-day comp just wrapped up, Adam. We've been agitating for red ball cricket domestically um, for, you know, well, especially for the countries that are actually bothering to play women's tests. It would be handy if they actually played some red ball cricket. Um, This one finished up a couple of days ago. The East Zone team, captained by DT Sharma, ended up triumphant. So they had a six-team competition, if you weren't across it, um, the very inventively named teams, East, West, North, South, well, that's it. That's all the options you think. How do you get to six? Central, good. Got to have a central team. And the northeast zone. So no no joy for the southwest or the southeast, but northeast got one. Anyway, so they had six teams and they managed to still play quarterfinals with six teams, which means they had four of them play and two of them got a bye into the semis. And then they, <laughs> then they played semis and a final. So it was it was kind of quaint in, in the, the way it was organised. But it was three-day red ball cricket it was played in Pune um those six teams up against each other across three days of peace um the final ended up being done relatively quickly all of the innings were between sort of 40 and, and 70 overs um and, and it was a low scoring game you know scores between 129 and uh 179 was was the third inning so 184 was what they had to chase in the last innings which they managed to do mostly thanks to DT who made 46 um but there were there were contributions all the way down the card and they ended up getting their nine down, so it was a, a very tight finish. But great to see some genuine multi-day domestic women's cricket played um, after banging away about it for so long. Australia did have that green and gold game they played that was a single three-day game, sort of exhibition game, but a bit better when you can have six teams involved and get a bunch of players um, the experience of playing the format. Look, I'm glad that it's happening, um, but it, it sounds to me like they're in dire need of a um a McIntyre Final Four system, if nothing else. <laughs> I mean, don't go to what they did in for the final six um in in the early nineties in in the AFL. That that didn't work. But they can you can go from six teams to four, mm. and then you can have a proper duke it out final series. Yep. And maybe fifth can play six in a plate. Yeah, they could play for a plate, just a plate of food. Yeah, it doesn't need to be a trophy. Okay, anyway, plate of but we can we can put that in a memo to the BCCI. Maybe they'll. Yep. Maybe they'll listen to us. Oh, definitely. I, I, I'm very, very bullish about that prospect. Um, but look, <laughs> it has happened. It's good that it's happened. Um, and yeah, hopefully there'll, there'll be more of it. Lots of red ball cricket happening across the county round that mm. you were watching. Well, you did the interview with Ben Bloom, which went up in the feed um, the day before this episode's going to come out. So if you want to go and listen to that, he's written a very in-depth book about the, the sort of future survival prospects of first-class cricket in England, basically, and, and some of the counties in particular, um, and that's resonated with a lot of people, the, um, the, the things that he's been bringing up. But, yeah, tell us about the round. Yeah, quite emotive, the stuff that he's writing about from, like, a dispassionate perspective because, you know, he's, he's like we all are, right? He's a cricket fan and he wants to see Red Bull cricket thrive and prosper, so... And this is the time of year to have these conversations. Inevitably, that that's where a lot of our focus goes to, like where we're seeing all this county cricket played around the country, but what of it in five years' time or, or 10 years' time and and so on? Well, I know I can tell you what happened this week. It was just runs galore. This was the – I neglected to mention in my rap last week that they're using the, the Kookaburra ball at the moment mm-hmm. for the first two rounds. It's not the first time we've seen the Kookaburra used in county cricket. It's happened quite a bit, actually, over the last five years at – at different points, but starting the season with it, um, that combined with pitches that in the first two weeks are the first pitch a curator has prepared for the season. They've had all winter to get this one up. Um, so usually they're, they're quite good batting conditions in the first round of the season. It tends to get a little bit harder in May, um, statistically at least. Uh, it was probably not a great combination. There was always going to be huge scores and I... I just detected a bit of a pattern yesterday of so many batters reaching at least 150 and had it confirmed by Sampson that it was the, the most number of 150 scores 
uh, in the history of the county championship in one round. So there were 11 scores above right. 150 in this round. And th there were draws everywhere. There were no results. It was still a very quirky round, though. And, and part of the reason there were draws everywhere was that the rain we had across the country today, which was disappointing. But it was mostly due to the game situation and where they got to. So, I mean, Division 1, I'll quickly go over the game that I was doing, um, the Surrey-Somerset game at the Oval, which looked like the one that was most likely to get a result. Somerset made 285 and 351. Tom Lamanby, who made those breakout centuries, three of them in the Bob Willis Trophy four seasons ago, he was terrific for 100 even. But he got in a mix-up with Matt Renshaw. They put on 178, Jeff. Mm. And then there was a collapse of seven for 20. And, and that was um, brought upon by Renshaw and Lamanby um, having a mix-up and running Renshaw out on, on 87. And that kind of set the tone for the game. There were like there were sharp turns everywhere you looked. Um, but the noteworthy bits are that Gus Atkinson bowled quickly. Um, Cam Steele and Dan Lawrence have combined for 20 wickets already this season. Um, and when you remember that Surrey only took 17 wickets with spin in mm. all of last season, right. and nine of them came in the final innings of the season, right? Mm. So going into the final innings of their championship winning back-to-back -back campaign, they'd only taken eight wickets with spin for the lot across five months. Then there was right. nine in the last innings. They've taken 20 in, in, in one and a half games. Remember, he only bowled once at, at Old Trafford last week. So that might be where they're evolving a little bit. For Surrey, uh, Sibley made 100 even as well. I'm a believer, Jeff. We've heard a lot of hype around Dom Sibley evolving his game over the winter. Alex Stewart's been talking about this. I've seen enough. Don't, I'm in. I'm all in on Dom Sibley having another life as a me. test cricketer. Why, he's no. only 28. Why would No. Why would he? What is he? Okay, I haven't seen it. Does it look the mm -hmm. same? Does it? No. Nope. No? No. Nope. He, he is... He, he, he was the one making the running early on in Surrey's okay. reply. No, I mean, I'm not, I'm not talking about does he bat. I'm not saying does he score more quickly. I'm saying does he aesthetically, does he, yep. does he base up in the same way? Or has he, has he oh, changed look, that? He, he scored. Remember, I think that, you know, the way we remember Dom Sibley's test career, in the mind's eye, it's the forward defence and it's the shovel through mid-wicket, right? Yeah. They, they were kind of the two things he did yep. and not much else unless he was fully set. Yep. He wasn't fully set by the time he was playing more expansively. Heaps through cover. Look, um, I, I just feel like there is more to run in the Dom, Dom Sibley story. Watch, yep. watch this space. For Somerset, they've got a young lad called Casey Aldridge. Went on the Lions trip this winter. Took five up, looked the goods. Like him a lot. Bowled really well at the end too in that chaotic finish that I referred to earlier. And Shower Bashir, um, who looks like a senior bowler, you know, coming back from an England trip, playing county championship cricket and kind of really looks like a senior player and, kept things tight and, and made, sure, made sure that Surrey never completely got away. Lewis Gregory, the new Somerset captain, made twin 50s. Captain's knock on the final day to get to 80. And he, he did open the door to that madness that I referred to when he got out and those three wickets fell. But nevertheless, two draws for the defending champions. And I mean, it doesn't mean they lose much ground though, because over at Chelmsford, well, Essex didn't quite finish the job against Kent. This was the other game where there was some jeopardy on the final day. But again, like a lot of these matches, started with so many runs on the first couple of days. So Essex made 530 for seven, declared. Elgar, in his second game, back mm -hmm. at his new club, or at his new club, I should say, made 120. And Matt Critchley, just after we spoke about him, Jeff, indeed, as we were releasing story time, yeah. which we talked about the, the benefits of playing four wrist spinners at the same time. Mm -hmm. You can go back and listen to that if you, if you haven't as yet. Critchley finished his 151 not out, four sixes when the declaration came. Right. Then Kent made 413, so a big response. Compton, uh, a, a, a century that went all the way through, nearly carried his bat. And Daniel Bell Drummond, the captain at Kent, making a, a second hundred in as many weeks, which I was quite excited by. Um, but with Essex with the ball, Critchley, Pfeiffer as well. So 150 not out and a Pfeiffer with the ball. So okay. he's got the best average for an England spinner over the last two years in the low 20s. So keep an eye on this. Right. Risty's all the way. That'd be a, that'd be a Samson special <coughs> as well. 150 plus Pfeiffer would have to be a more exclusive list than the 100 and the five mm. of, of which I'm sure there have been, well, probably a, a truckload of them in first-class cricket given the, the sheer volume of games played and, and the way that sometimes, you know, one, well, particularly first-class cricket that's a bit mismatched, you can have one player who bosses a, a, a lower-grade team really given the way mm. first-class cricket's been structured over the years. But it's still, you know, it's 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 got to be up there. 150 and 5, but nothing to sneeze at. 
great way to start the season. So Kent ended up, um, sorry, rather, Essex went ballistic in their second innings. 257 for four, declared in 40 overs to set the game up. Jordan Cox, great recruit over from Kent, now playing for Essex. 116 not out from 89 balls, only 23. He's been on an, been on a senior England white ball trip. It won't be long before we're hearing his name more mm. and more, I reckon. And then Kent were under pressure. They they um they were set a squillion, um, and they were under the pump losing four early wickets. But they got out of it, Jeff, um, because not only was Joe Denley batting at the end, but Jaden Denley, an 18 year old on debut, Joe's nephew. So Joe Denley huh. and his 18-year-old nephew made 39 and 41, respectively, in the final session to keep Essex away from wow. victory. They, 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 they were seven down when handshakes were, um, were arrived at late on day four. But, yes, um, nice to know there's another how, how Denley did, that, uh, making his way through. Sort of Chanderpool area. So does, it, does Diamond Joe Denley now have to be renamed Uncle Joe Denley? Um, is that, <laughs> it seems like the only reasonable way to proceed from this point on. Um, yeah. How old's, how old's Diamond Joe? Well, he, he's only like. I think he 30s, might be like. It? I feel like 19 Ashes, he was already like 33 or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, sure. But he's not, a, he's not a 40s cricketer. He's a 30s cricketer. No, no. I suppose no, you no. can be. There are people who have uncles and aunts who are younger than them. Like, that is possible. If, you know, if, you, if somebody has a kid young at, say, you know, 20, and then that kid has a kid at 18, and then the parents sometimes produce one 20 years later. You know, it does happen. You can you can have it. You know, Uncle Joe could be three years younger than his nephew um, in the way that families work, the quirks of, of family trees. This happened with my mum. She was born a long, 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 long time after my grandfather's first kid. So there's right. that quirk, there's that little yeah. wrinkle there. Um, two draws that were less eventful, Hampshire, Lanks. That was um, not a huge amount to talk about there. Nathan Lyon um, picked up his first wickets for Lanks, three for 110 from 38.1 overs. James Vince was his first wicket oh, for his county. Oh, poor old James Vince. It's Nathan yeah, Lyon who runs him out of around the, the corner. Um, in, in that, oh, yes, of that, course. That Ashes turning point when Vince is 80-odd and batting beautifully and England look like they might be on top. 2017, um, and Vince 17, pushes that one yeah. out to cover point. Lyon swoops in one-handed, nails the non-striker stumps. Um, yeah, so Jesus, it must have just been... <laughs> He must. He must have. James Vince must be waking in the night to a vision of Nathan Lyon sitting at the side of his bed. You go, hungry? Want some milk and cookies, mate? <laughs> nice recall. I wish I remembered that when I was on commentary talking about it the other day. Anyway, um, for Lanks, uh, Keaton Jennings joined the 150 club. He made 172. Great to see um, Jennings picking up from where he left off mm-hmm. last year. Poor old George Bell, the youngster, was run out for 99, which you don't see too often. Yeah. Um, and Dawson, Liam Dawson, you know, I wish he went to India. I, I'm sad about that. That that never really felt right with me. Yeah. I, know, I understand why he didn't go. I, I, I thoroughly respect his decision. But, you know, another four for another 80-odd, extraordinary 2023 that like, yeah. does feel like that. That wasn't quite right. Anyway, yeah. well, to, um, on the flip side, mate. on the flip side of him not going India to India, we'll say okay, he took four wickets in that innings. That means he took as many wickets as England got heavy defeats in that Test series. So maybe <laughs> sitting that one out was the best way to go. Similar trajectory uh, at Trent Bridge with Knotts and Worcester. Knotts made three ninety nine. Joe Clark two hundreds in a row. Worcester three fifty five. Jason Holder made a duck for Worcester. Um, I thought his red ball career was over, but he's playing as a pro at Worcester. Um, in the in the four day team when he didn't make himself available for the Windies Test trip to Australia a couple of months ago, I think he, he didn't he didn't say he would never play Test cricket again. Though. He just said he wasn't available right. for that tour. I'm pretty sure mm. from off the top of my head. Uh, but you know, don't like it. Yeah. Uh, it well, it, look, if he played, if he played, potentially West Indies don't have that magnificent win at the Gabba. You know, if he'd been there, True. then things would have changed. You know, the scores would have been different one way or the other. Um, Maybe they would have thrashed Australia. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> but, but we wouldn't have seen the thing that we saw. We wouldn't have seen Shamar Joseph on the last day. One for you here, Jeff. Calvin Harrison took a five up, but ignore that. Three Corton Bowls. Now, not, that, not that Calvin went to, Harris, that's not... the, um, the teacher. Yes, no. no that, that, that'd be good if he were taking three catches <laughs> off his own bowling. We've learnt now the record is five. There was a there was an Indian Aranji Trophy game where a bowler took five catches off their own bowling. Wow. Um, so that's a, a Samson special. Not swerve. 151 for seven when uh, when handshakes were arrived at there. More wild runs to finish in Division 1, Jeff. This is, again, this is ridiculous stuff. Warwickshire at home against Durham, 698 for three declared. Now, my first question, why declare at 698? Just tick the board over two more runs, mm, boys. Mm. 
It doesn't matter. No. In the sweep of things, you've had it for that long. Yeah. Come on. Yeah, give us something. Give us something nice. Give us a nice round number. Um, because then, then you have to yeah. qualify it. You know, when you have to say, well, oh, when they made seven, oh, when they nearly made seven hundred, when they made just about yeah. seven hundred. If we could just Annoying. say they made seven hundred, that would be a lot easier. Make me a lot happier. So Rob Yates, one ninety one. Alex Davies, new captain, uh, previously of Lancashire, two hundred and fifty six. Not the only two fifty. Yeah. We'll come to another one soon. Uh, and um, yeah, Rhodes, one seventy eight. Not out. Poor old Ed Barnard. After all that. Second ball duck, having having had a really good year last year. So everyone else cashed in apart from him. But that's against Matty Potts, none for 106. Mm-hmm. Scott Boland, none for 54. Ben Rain, none for 100. And Bryden Cass, none for 128. I mean, I don't think that's, I don't think it's exaggerating it by saying that's pretty much a test attack. And they, none of them have Ooh. taken a wicket. Uh, and they've all gone. They've all really gone around. So um, you, again, this is, a, a, I guess, a, a story about the pitches, a story about the balls, and, and so on. But Durham respond with five seventeen, right? So keep that number in mind. Five seventeen. Alex Lee's makes one hundred and forty five. So jug avoidance for not reaching one fifty. If you ask me, I'm I'm fining him for that. No, I'm, but he I, did I, reach I, I his ten thousand for not notching a ludicrous milestone. <laughs> yeah, I should, I should have noted that this 150 thing I've got going on this week kind of means nothing to you. Mm, um, nonsense. But uh, yes, Except he, for the 200. The his... ones who made doubles, you know, okay, I'll take that. Yeah, he passed his 10,000th first class run on his 31st birthday, which I thought was nice. Okay. Um, but after batting for 140 overs and making 517, remembering that Warwickshire made 698, they still haven't avoided the follow on. So they become oh, the third team 150 in, in first class history. Okay to hit 500 and still have to follow on. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> so um, anyway, it didn't go so badly for them second time. They made 293 for six when they finished up. Matty Potts came in as night watchman and made 149 odd out. Oh, More jug on. avoidance at Durham. Come on. More. He's a, what he's like, get behind he's like a nine. He's like a nine, 10. How's he made 150? What? I thought you were upset at, for, for mine. I mean, I said the 11... The 11 instances oh, right. of 150 or above. The record I mean, was nine 12. before yeah. this, right? Okay. So the record was nine before this. If we had gone from 11 to 13, this would have been like when Flojo mm. broke the world record. Mm. I mean, I know that was, you know, not, not, not legit, but a world record that would never be broken. 13 150s in a round. We should have had it. It was if legit, only it's legit Potts made one me. more run. I mean, I think the doping is offset by the length of the fingernails because surely they must have slowed it down. Um, you know, she would have run a faster time without the accoutrements. <laughs> So you know, you're in you're, you're in you're in difficult terrain here. Anyway, that was obviously a draw. Next week, Essex, Lanks, Hampshire, Warwickshire, uh, Kent have got Surrey down there at Canterbury. Somerset hosting Knots and Worcestershire have Durham, which isn't sadly at New Road because of the problems they're having with their ground, which are just so bad so they can't yeah, get on there at all yeah, because I've it's flooded. Updates about that. Um, Even when it's still so flooded, the turf's ruined. And yeah, I don't it's know. I mean, just a, it's a they, really sad story. Are they going to have to move? grounds so is this gonna it's gonna it, it need feels to be a that way yeah thing? ashley giles is now talking about that openly it, right. it's just really sad so um it feeds into that wider story that if you're interested in like the future of domestic cricket in england and i think a lot of people even if they're not english would be like listen to the interview with ben bloom from yesterday because yeah. he, he does write he does synthesize things so well and then Go out and read his book, which I did over the weekend. It's well worth it. Uh, Division two, much the same. The best game was Gloucestershire nearly pulling off a miracle at Bristol against Yorkshire. So, um, yeah, I, sad to say that it, 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 it feels like Gloucester are about to um, release some dreadful financial results. There were some reports in the paper about that today. It's the same story I, I, I regret to say about where they're trending money-wise. But on the park, Yorkshire... 326, Shah Massoud, Pakistan captain, 140. Then 434 for six declared, Adam Lai, the 100. Everyone cashing in really mm, like they are around the country. Week. Yeah, he did indeed. Gloucestershire, Cam Bancroft, top scored with 70 out of 263. Then they're set 498. And at T, they're like 180 away, five wickets down. And like we're all going, this is going to be one of the great stories that, you know, as Gloucestershire are really battling financially, they're going yeah. to. They're going to chase down 498 and win the game in the final day. It didn't happen. There was more rain. They needed one more session, um, but they got over 400 for six in the fourth innings. Ollie Price, who's made his fourth first-class ton by the age of 22, made 147. More 150 avoidance. So it was shitty at that um, late in the day. And James Bracey, kind of the forgotten man of English cricket, having played a couple of test matches back in 2021, 
also made a ton. Joe Root played. First time he's played for Yorkshire in two years. He made two in the first innings and 51 in the second. Right. So they were 90, what, 93 runs away, four wickets in hand with a session to play um, when it got washed out. They they made 100 in the final session. Oh, but they right. lost some time in it. Yeah, they, they needed one more session, okay. really. Like, they were just... It was tantalising, I guess, when they were going yeah. so well through the early part of the day. Mm. Um, Wantage Road was a total road. Um, Middlesex visiting North Ants. North Ants made 552 for six declared. Emilio Gay, 261 on his 24th birthday. Um, fifth hundred. I, I, again, same, same, uh, same thread I'm going to pick up on here. Does he leave? Does he go to a bigger county? Does he leave North Hansi's childhood club? I, I don't know. But mm. this is, again, this, this idea of smaller counties when players reach a certain point, they do look elsewhere, not only for financial security, but that, like, is he going to get an opportunity to even push for England selection playing Division 2 for North Hans? Right. I, I don't know, but probably not. Um, certainly had a good day out, though. 261 for him, the second 250 of the round. James Sales made 113, not out for North Hans. I mentioned that because it's his first ton. And, and the son of David, who we've talked about on right. Storytime in the past, former North Hans. Great. Um, brutal for middle Texas bowlers, as it was last week with Glamorgan when Sam Northeast hit the triple hundred. Bamba, Higgins, Roland Jones, Helm, Josh DeCares, they're just absolutely copying it. But at least the Middlesex batters were able to do as they did last week. Well, last week, too, and eventually secure a first innings lead. They made 553 for two. Uh, and that was a one-run lead at Stumps on day three. They got no play on day four due to the rain up in up in Northampton. But Nathan Fernandez, good story. On to Boo, 19 years of age, made 103. Um, he's a local lad who um, is from a working-class background. He was getting the bus to training and games until very recently. His dad's a chef in a local restaurant, so um, we'll be following his career. Hopefully he can kick on with it after a ton, albeit in pretty friendly circumstances. Max Holden made an unbeaten 211. And Lewis Deploy, 196 not out at Stubbs Day 3, didn't get back for Day 4 because of the rain. Mm. So he was um, he was stranded on on that score. Surely they could... Another, surely, like, when, once you're... You know, I'm sure it's raining. And, but once you're really close to it being called off and there's five minutes to go, you're like, just go out and bowl him one ball. You know, just give him, give him a shot at it. Let's all give just, him a chance. Let's all just run out with some brollies. <laughs> Whip the covers off for two minutes, bang the stumps in, bowl in one ball, you know, see if he gets it. If he doesn't, that's his fault. Simpler times. I suspect that would have happened Probably, in, in yeah. the era of uncovered pitches. Another near 700 declaration. What's going on, Jeff? This was Sussex at, um, at, at Grace Road. So Leicester made 338, Hanscom 51 for those paying attention to our pal of the show. Hudson Prentice took five for, for Sussex. Very good player. He's one to watch in the future. Um, Sussex reply was 694 for nine declared. Just get this bowled out. Terrific. Have a chance at 700. Yeah. Just do it. This Just do it. Watching some um, of this John stuff Simpson. Must have been not, not great. I mean, you know, there were, there yeah, were some no, exciting I, ending bits, but some of this, some of the middles of these games. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this was the theme of the week. Yep. So John Simpson has moved from Middlesex to Sussex to captain down there, made 205 not out. Okay. Tom Haynes, 108. Danny Lamb at a new club, moving from Lanks, 134, then Leicestershire. 86 for one and nothing much doing there. Final game, which I'll skip through very, very quickly. It was probably one of the better ones, but it didn't quite reach its uh, its conclusion because of rain again. Derbyshire didn't play a single ball last week, Jeff. And they didn't get on until an hour to go on day one of this game either um, at Cardiff against Glamorgan. But the game moved along. Glamorgan all out 237. Alex Thompson took seven for the first Derbyshire spinner to take a seven for since Jeff Miller in 1982. Christ. That's good. That felt that felt like something. Um, Derby all something. out one ninety. It's not much of something, but it's something. Not much of something. I mean, the, but, you know, you know, we're, we're not this, this... The, the, the annals of cricket history are not filled with famous Derbyshire spinners, are they? <laughs> Probably not. Well, Miller, good bowler. Um, uh, we we had a Miller Tavare style catch with um in that Surrey game to yeah. get the, the game moving um on on day one. I think anyway, it's, it's not coincidence that Jeff Miller is remembered for a rebound catch rather than for you know his prodigious. Uh, efforts with putting <laughs> revs on the ball. Derbyshire, 198. Mason Crane took a fourth. I don't hear much about him in red ball cricket these days, but now these days playing at Glamorgan. Uh, they made 361 for seven, declared, and this round was finally over. Um, Chris Cook, 127 not out. So eight matches um, in Division Two. All of them have been draws. A combination of rain and the Kookaburra is not a good one. <laughs> 
hopefully mm. uh, we never see the Kookaburra used in April again. Uh, and next week it's Derbyshire Leicester. Middlesex have got Yorkshire at Lords. North Hats right. are hosting Glamorgan and Sussex hosting Gloucestershire. So not a not a not a memorable round for results, but I guess for weird stuff it wasn't so bad. Did it just not swing? Was that the main issue? Did it not move? You know what it's like. I mean, it swings at the start, yep. but on flatties. Yeah, you know, but, uh, but we're it, used it, to seeing it when it's 38 degrees and you're playing on a hard pitch in Australia. So I, I would have thought yeah. in England it might give you a bit more. Yeah, I, I, I guess. It just didn't, like from the highlights I saw, that I think it has as much to do with the fact that these are the first pitches of the year. Yeah. So Daniel's been crunching these numbers for years. The only month of the year where you get better value as a batter is June, hmm. right in the heart of summer. Okay. Well, near enough the heart of summer. Right. So it gets tougher in May. So maybe they should use the Kookaburra in May yeah. when there's a natural advantage for the Duke's ball. Sure. I don't know. Sure. I'm sure that'll be something they look at All right. into the future. County. Um, Jeff, we've got one more England wrap. Done. Sorry, you yes, were trying to end the segment. I was trying to end the segment. I was trying to tell you that we we forgot to talk about the Ben Stokes thing last week, which I found funny. Yeah, you um, go. And, and, you know, that he's decided to pull out of the the T20 World Cup, but remembering that he pulled out of the 50 over World Cup and then pulled into the 50 over World Cup and remembering that he played the match winning hand in the T20 World Cup final, which was about five minutes ago. I could I, I can understand this given that they have T20 World Cups, you know, every three months these days. You probably like, why not just leave it on the one that you won and having that nice memory of when things felt good rather than saying like, I've got to G myself up for another one and, and potentially not have that be, be the end of my career in that format i suppose but um i mean he's 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 back to bowling he's he's trying to get his knee right so that he can bowl in test matches and so on and basically said that trying to prepare himself for england's test summer means that he doesn't want to go and play a 20 over tournament in june i think this is fairly commendable i reckon his last innings is that one at the mcg jeff the 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 t20 World Cup winning one. You know, that was his first half century and only half century, therefore, in T20Is, and he saved it for a World Cup winner. Um, anyway, there you go. It's very Ben Stokes of him. Um, but, yeah, I, I like the idea that he's saying, no, I want to have one more crack at being a test bowler. And if he can be, that'll open up all sorts of options, especially in Pakistan where they are uh, later in the year. Um, on other T20 World Cup stuff, we're going to be watching um, the opening match of the tournament together on the 1st of June, which is only, like, seven weeks away or something like that. Um, It's going to be a party in the USA when they play Canada in that match. They beat Canada 4-0 or 4-zip in a T20 series this week where Corey Anderson starred in the final one. I haven't thought about Corey for a while. Words Um, that rhyme with Corey. 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 Story. Story. Allegory. Montessori. (laughs) Um, So he... he, uh, uh, yeah, we're, we're going to be there. The final word's going to be there. Um, we're not doing live shows or, or anything quite that extravagant, but we will do meetups and we will generally, you know, enjoy being not where we, you know, enjoy the novelty of being in New York. And and part of that, a big part of that is going to be Westfield, who I was meant to mention off the top of the show, mm-hmm. completely failed to do so. They'll forgive us because we're going to be spending – Jeff, so much time uh, working with them, and that's going to include an extra special effort in the USA where um, Westfield, London, and Stratford City, it's the same wider world that the Westfields that America are part of, so we'll get a chance to do lots of of fun stuff over there. Yeah, Um, and a a less direct link to the Westfields in Australia where obviously it's just been an absolutely horrific weekend, and that's something that a lot of people will will be thinking about and, and are thinking about and will be for, for a long time to come so yeah. all of our thoughts with the people involved there um this is a, a somewhat disconnected part of the, the wider universe um just given that it might be a bit odd if we're chatting about it in a in a breezy way um with all of the context yeah. of, of what's happened in the last few days that's it's a good point I, I didn't sort of clock those two because i i sort of think of them as different entities but yeah you're quite right in, in making that point on the way through. Um, in terms of uh, our relationship with Westfield London and Westfield Stratford City, uh, they wanted us to remember that the county championship is back. We do know that. We've we just do, been talking yeah. about it. Pitches are green, the days are rain affected, and the keepers are up to the stumps, which can only mean summer, proper summer, is around the corner. And there's no better place to get you ready for summer holidays than Westfield London and Westfield Stratford City. Whether you're planning on sunning yourself on the shores of the... Adriatic, I can Adriatic. never quite pronounce that. Adriatic, Adriatic that. is a is Adriatic. A, is a sea. 
I believe. Not, not uh, an ocean, yeah, I know I've been there. That's that's the one in Croatia, right? Yeah. The Adriatic, yeah. the one, the, the one no, between, no, no, it's, the one it's between it's Italy and Croatia, might be. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know. I know it's the place you go and you take the sort of you know the, the golden hour, um, not the not the Trump version of that. The golden hour where you, where you take the photos of the the golden um, uh, orange uh, sunlight sun on on you Adriatic. while you are in, in like a kayak or you know floating yeah. on a, a pontoon or something, looking uh, impossibly That's beautiful. Or, or whether you're uh, navigating screaming kids at Butlins, which is kind of the the um, the, the, it's like a theme park holiday over here. Oh, no. I, I hope not to go on one of those yeah. when, when the girls are older, but yeah. I suspect I probably will. No. Uh, you can find everything Make you need bed. to fill your suitcase. And if you've left your holiday planning to the last minute, pop into TUI at Westfield Stratford City and let them do the hard work for you so you can focus on finding a hotel with enough good Wi-Fi to stream Leicestershire versus Glamorgan instead of spending time with your family. Well written, Sheehan. Well said, Westfield, London, Stratford City. More extra, less ordinary. They are our principal partner uh, in year 2024, and we couldn't be happier about it, Jeff. That's it. Time for a break. We've got uh, a fair bit more to come right after that. Final word, Adam Collins and Jeff Lemon. Final segment of this weekly show. Now, Jeff. The French women's team is on our agenda mm-hmm. this week. 17 players called in for an investigation because they have disbanded. Their governing body allegedly have been staging fake matches to secure more funding from the ICC. I know you've been working on this a little mm-hmm. bit behind the scenes. What on earth is going on here? Yeah, this is this is a, a bizarre story, which first started bubbling up a few months ago, the initial um, revelations from some journalists in that part of the world um, who were doing tremendous work was showing up that there were fake scorecards being submitted. And there's really very little doubt about this. There, there, there are players that just don't exist. Uh, basically, in order to get your ICC funding, you need to stage a certain number of women's matches involving a certain number of women's teams. You know, they had three or four teams. They didn't have the eight or so teams that they were supposed to have. They didn't have a second division, which they were supposed to have. And so there are there are teams that no one has ever heard of, featuring players that no one has ever heard of, with matches allegedly being played on ground um, that didn't host matches on those days or that hosted other matches on those days and couldn't possibly have hosted the ones in question. Um, the people running the show are in full denial mode, saying, no, 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 none of this is true. This has never happened. The ICC have said, no, everything's cool. Um, everything's been explained to our satisfaction. Um, and so the, the players in the actual women's national team, um, well, 17 of them signed an open letter saying that they want clarification. Um, they, they want an, a proper investigation. They want to know what is going on because as far as they know, and they're the players who are actually actively playing, um, these games didn't take place and these teams don't exist. They've all been sacked subsequently by the um, the administration. They've said, don't bother coming to training. Um, you're going to be disbanded. And now the national um, administration, such as it is, it's a pretty small operation, is apparently trying to recruit a bunch of players from New Caledonia who, are, who qualify to play for France um, so that they can put together a um, faux national women's team to replace the players who've spoken out. The whole thing's a debacle. Um, and yes, I'm hoping to look into it in some more depth with some of the people who were more closely involved over the next couple of weeks. Are you trying to tell me that they, they weren't really playing games at Roland Garros after all? <laughs> that Emily Moresmo wasn't batting number three for the, the French domestic team? I'm gutted. Um, right, okay. That, that, look, I can see how that might happen. I, I've heard whispers of similar things happening in other parts of the world where there is this requirement to meet this criteria that countries feel like they can't meet and thus they, they turn to this corrupt practice to get the money. Um, yeah, it, it does feel like the sort of thing that, that could be gamed and has been gamed. And, well, I'm looking forward to your um, further investigations on this. That could make for quite a good podcast step. Um, so um, best of luck mm. with that. I'll leave you to it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting one. Um, some pretty grim stuff. Uh, coming through on Michael Slater, the former Australian opener who um, has been in all kinds of legal trouble over the last couple of years um, relating to ongoing stalking charges, domestic violence charges. Um, He's been in court for this before, but it looks like there have been more recent offences up until only a few days ago. Um, He was arrested again 
in in the last few days um, ended up in in police custody again, and he's being charged with more offences of stalking, intimidation, domestic violence, and it seems like he's. He, uh, broke into the house. I'm, I'm going to assume of his his ex wife, who was the one who he was who was the target of most of this um, horrific behaviour, uh, which which must have been recently. So he's being charged with assault. I mean, it's 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 yeah, really horrific stuff. Yeah, nineteen charges all up, according to the report uh, that we read uh, last night on Crick Info, and these are all in relation to what's happened between the 5th of December last year and the 12th of April this year. So there was a whole batch of reporting on this late last year, and this, this sort of post-dates that, so that yeah, kind of underpins how how awful um, this situation clearly is. Uh, and look, the, 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 the fact that he was... Uh, um, that he was remanded in police custody doesn't um, doesn't reflect well upon the situation either, does it? That he wasn't sort of al- allowed out after being charged. They're, they're sort of keeping yeah. him um, for the time being. Well, so there, there's been so much more on that, as we... that you know, this, is, this yeah. has been ongoing for such a long time that surely it has to reach a point where you can't just keep being allowed to walk out again. Sure, sure. Uh, and also um, on legal matters, um, Stuart McGill, um, again, this is according to reports, will stand trial later this year. Um, in relation to a, a large scale cocaine deal, um, he was um, in the district court on Friday where he entered a, a not guilty plea uh, to one count of taking part in the supply of a large commercial quantity of a prohibited drug. Um, and look, this all goes back to the kidnapping um, that was reported widely on in 2021. Um, he's denied repeatedly any wrongdoing in all of this, but um, he's now going to face trial in, in November um, this year um, in a hearing that, that will run across the course of a, a full week. So that sounds um, pretty serious yeah. for Stuart McGill. Yeah, I mean, that, that's that's a, a frightening sort of level of, of offence to be charged with. And, yeah, it, it's it, it's all been such a tangled story that who knows what's actually happened you know, with that. With yep. that kidnapping, there was sort of speculation about whether it was real or whether it was faked or whether it was, you know, whether it was to do with um, whether his his explanations for why it had happened were spurious or not. Um, so I suppose more will come out once we hit the court. 